Okay, good afternoon, folks. Um, I just want to start very quickly before I explain my presentation just by giving you a very, very brief introduction to who Harper Adams University actually is. Um, so our mission statement is higher education and research for the delivery of a sustainable food chain uh, and rural economy. And we have the, the number of different academic departments all linked to that mission statement. Okay, so that in a nutshell is, is what we're here for. Um, we're based in the middle of the UK in a county called Shropshire, which most people from the UK haven't even heard of. Um, and we're based in the middle of a full working commercial farm. So we're a campus university with a full working commercial farm that has to exist for a profit based around us that's also used for teaching and for research. Uh, and the history is that in 1901, Thomas Harper Adams, uh, the estate owner, died, left his estate to the future of education. So we started off teaching agriculture and then agricultural mechanization, agricultural engineering, and so on. Um, and we have a number of sort of interesting additions to that, things like the Regional Food Academy, looking at food science, food technology, and also renewables, so things like an anaerobic digester. A um, couple of statistics. Uh, we recently shortlisted for University of the Year in the UK. We have uh, consistently high graduate employability, so that tends to put us towards the top of the list year in, year out. And 100% of our research was internationally recognised. Okay? Um, and I'm here today from the engineering department. We do a number of engineering degrees, including agricultural engineering, at a number of levels right up to master's and then beyond into postgraduate to include PhDs. And we also are home of the, the UK Agriculture Engineering Innovation Centre and the National Centre for Precision Farming. Okay. So just with that brief history, and, and sorry, we we're also shortlisted recently for our contribution to innovation technology. So I just wanted to give you the context to try and explain a little bit more about why we're here talking to you today. Um, we work with a whole range of industrial partners um, the likes of John Deere, Class, so uh, big manufacturers from all around the world. Um, and they help us design our course, they employ our graduates, uh, they go into partnership with us on research ventures. So we work very much hand in hand with the sort of organisations that you can see on the screen. Now, in the UK, there was a report commissioned recently, uh, an independent report, on the status of UK graduates from technology, uh, engineering and science. And that report said that 54% of graduates were not meeting employer expectations. And the main shortfalls were to do with practical experience, leadership skills, and also their technical expertise. So quite a range there. Um, but our experience from our graduates over the past few, week, past few years, we've worked hard on this, and this is one of the things I want to explain to you today, um, is that the industry sees us as a centre of excellence. And I think that's partly because they're involved in the development of these people that they then go on to employ. Okay? And as part of our degree, all of our students have to spend a year in industry working as an engineer or an agricultural engineer uh, in a paid role. Okay? And they have to do that to, to proceed with their degree. Okay, so let's get back to the topic in hand then. Um, so we're looking at addressing the needs and challenges for innovation agricultural curricula. And one of the things I'm going to focus on during my, my presentation is the work that we're doing on the developing technologies, okay? but also some of the educational uh, principles behind how we're delivering that as well. So we'll look forwards with the technology, but also how we're delivering it. Um, and in a way, we can compare the current farming system um, with industrial production lines. Okay? The current farming system developed in this way for maximum crop production after the war in the same way that industrial production lines are set up to mass produce vehicles. Okay? So just a very brief history of that. So before we had the production line, there was a lot of localised activity. So vehicles would get built in small batches and then they would have to be squeezed together. Okay? So they, they typically didn't fit, there was no real control, very labour intensive, very slow going, small volume. Um, and then Henry Ford, you will all I'm sure know the Ford Motor Company, introduced the production line and that gave him increased volume. Okay? They could manufacture a car in stages, in a line very quickly, but he couldn't get the variety. So lots of competitors sprung up 
and they could get the variety, but they couldn't get the same volume as him. Okay? So the car industry had developed a lot of competition, some developments, but they still had problems. So over the last 30, 40, 50 years, they have developed processes, which I'm going to propose to you in a minute, we can use within the agricultural production system to help solve the problems that we're facing as well. And it can all be encapsulated by the term lean thinking. Okay, it's called various other things as well, but I'm going to refer to it as lean thinking today. Um, and that's got three core principles. So there's the identification of value. What is of value to the customer? The elimination of waste, so anything that isn't of value to the customer. Things like overproduction, defects, moving things around unnecessarily. Um, and then there's this generation of flow and in particular of value to the customer. Okay, so if we very much simplify the car production process, we feed in raw materials on the left, and then we do some processes with them in the middle, and the output is a car. Okay, so these are the processes in the middle, and then what you can see is this round here, and we call this the burger model. Okay, hopefully you can see why. Um, and anything around here are support services. So anything down the middle is the focus. So when we're manufacturing a car, this is anything that adds value, okay, value, to the production of the car. So people on the production line that are putting parts on the vehicle are adding value. Whereas the managing director of the company is a support person around the edge because he is just enabling that. He's not actually part of that. Marketing, etc. all support services around the edge. And it works for education as well. So we've looked at the car manufacturing process. The same can be said for growing crop. Seed in, we do some production with that, and we get food out of the other side in the loosest possible sense. And then with education, we start off with uh, somebody who has left school or college. We throw the curriculum at them. This is our bit. And out the end, we want somebody that is ready to meet the needs of employers. Now, the car industry faced the challenge of increasing output and quality and reducing their costs, which you could argue is the same challenge that we're looking at today in agriculture and also in academia. Slight change of tack. If we go back to the title of what we're looking at, addressing the needs and challenges for innovation, if we look at the definition of the word innovation, a new idea, so it could be creating something new, but it could also be doing things better, more effective process, okay? better solutions. And you'll notice the word needs keeps cropping up. Sources of innovation, so this robotics engineer stated that innovation only requires a recognized need, competent people with relevant technology, and the financial support. So from that, if we want our graduates to be innovative, this shows us that one of the key skills they need is the ability to identify what their customer needs, as in the need. And again, engineering and the manufacturing process has tools already in place to help establish that voice of the customer, the customer requirements. So if we start to gather that customer need that we've identified, and we've already said as well that we need technically competent people, okay? So they need those, both of those skills. And look ahead now at the technology. So where is farming going? So we've already seen the increasing pressures that farmers are gonna face. I won't dwell on those. But my proposal is that this global security issue can be addressed by the application of this lean philosophy that's been learned from the car industry to arable production systems. So to produce more, actually, we waste less. And hopefully, we'll put less into the system, less energy, less resources, fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. Okay? And ultimately, it's that reduction of waste, rather than perhaps necessarily increasing the production. Okay. So if you want a bit of a vision, perhaps, of where we see the future of agricultural robots going, this is our artist impression but we are actually actively working to develop these technologies and that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about now.
but let's keep the principles in mind. Okay? If we simplify the model a little bit, let's assume we're going to keep the seeds, the sprays, the fertilizer, etc., the same. Okay? Just to remove the variable. We want to try and remove any machine constraints that are imposed on us. Do we really need a big tractor? Do we need to keep doubling the size of the equipment? Um, we want to focus on the plant need. Because if we go back to that earlier process model, that, that, the, the needs of the plant, the actual taking the seeds and running from the plant, are the core business. That's what we need to focus on. And to do this, we need to join all of the dots in a big farm management system. Okay. So, if I break it down to four main stages, crop establishment, crop scouting, crop care, selective harvesting, and we'll work through them. But first, very brief introduction to compaction. This changing environment around the world, um, with bigger, heavier machines, you've probably seen that at some point. Okay. So, we're making machines bigger all the time, because driver costs are a big issue. Okay, so if we can double the work rates, it keeps costs down. But actually, we're compounding the problem. Okay, a little bit of engineering for you. Every one kil kilonewton of draft force needs one kilonewton of vertical force. Now, actually, we put a, we, we make a bigger machine into the field. Okay, a bigger machine weighs more, so it compacts the ground more. The more we compact the ground, the bigger the implement we then need to tow to remove the compaction. So therefore we've got a bigger machine again, so therefore we've put in more compaction, and therefore we need an even bigger implement. So we are causing the problem by keep making the machines bigger. We are wasting energy. Okay? And we end up with a smaller working time window, which, which needs a bigger machine because of these climate problems. Um, but the bigger the machine, the smaller the working time window. It, it's this vicious circle. Okay? So horsepower, making a bigger tractor, doesn't help when weight is the problem. Now, we'd like to be able to, but we can't change the weather. But what we can change is the tractor. Okay? And we estimate that up to 90% of the energy that's going into cultivation is there to repair the damage that we've put in in the first place. Up to 96% of the field area is compacted by tyres in random traffic systems. Okay? So if we don't damage it in the first place, we haven't got to repair it goes back to what I said earlier, reduce waste. Okay, So we're doing a lot of studies at the minute looking ahead at controlled traffic farm. Okay, and that's the sort of tram lines that you can, the sort of traffic that you can see across a field uh, in any one period. Okay? Um, and to do that, we're using technology by developing route planning software. And we have technology in place now where you can log on to Google Maps, take a snapshot of a field, and it automatically uh, finds the edge of the field, and plots the most efficient route. Okay, so in terms of crop establishment then, we're developing an ultralight seeding robot. Okay, this is how we're trying to get to that vision that I presented to you a few minutes ago. Uh, very lightweight, has a very light con uh, contact patch, uh, causes no ag agronomic damage, okay, even when the field is waterlogged. Um, so this is our prototype machine here. You can see it's driverless, it's autonomous. Uh, the robot can control it. Um, from the field mapping software that we just, just showed. Um, and here you will see a waterlogged field. That's a flooded footprint. So somebody stood on there has caused that. The machine driving over, there is no flooding because it's barely made a dent. Okay. So, robotic seeder then. We've got a machine that can, that can travel over this ground. What we're looking at is can we only cultivate for each individual seed rather than, than blanket cultivation? Um, and if we know exactly where we've put the seeds, then anything else that's there is just going to be a weed. So it helps us to detect it. So we can set it up to plant it so we have maximum space between the crops, or we can do it in a regular pattern like this. We can use smaller, lighter machines. So we can have a lead vehicle followed by numerous other smaller vehicles that follow it and plant them exactly where we need them and they can do this 24-7, okay? because they can just go out and do it themselves. Once we know where the crop is exactly, let's look at weeding for a minute. Because they're planting that grid pattern, we can very simply come along and remove the red weeds. Okay? And that can all be done autonomously and very accurately. 
So let's look at crop scouting for a minute. Again, the vision of the future. So we've been working with agronomists um, to give real time, uh, near real-time data over the whole farm. Using a combination of unmanned ground vehicles, so these autonomous tractors that we've just been looking at, and unmanned aerial vehicles, so drones, UAVs. Um, and the real key here is gathering data. Okay? And I'll come back to that in a minute. But there's all sorts of things we can look at. Crop cover, um, thermal, NDVI, all sorts of different uh, technical aspects that we can capture. Okay? But data collection, understanding the problem, is the key. And these are the vehicles that we've developed to try and do that, the unmanned ground vehicles. So we have one that we've named Bernasis, looking at uh, crop scouting in, vine in vineyards, um, thermal camera for irrigation status, a multi-spectral camera for nutrient status, LIDAR for canopy extent and density, and then we've got a similar orchard sensing robot as well, with this whole management system for that data. Developed by our students, final year master's level students, actively involved in these funded projects. Okay, if we look at crop care a minute. Um, so organic uh, mechanical weeding is very expensive, £1,000 a hectare roughly, needs to be repeated three times during the cycle. If you get an infestation, then the whole crop is wasted. Okay? Very expensive, very problematic. But we have systems that can detect these rows. Okay? And as we've just looked at, if we know the row, we know where the crop is, we can actually use technology to highlight what to weed. So the, the camera knows what to weed and what to plant. And if we know what's the weed and what's the plants, then the idea is, is that we can target the chemicals just on the weed. So again, not blanket. We use as, uh, as little as possible using that accurate technology. Then we go to the next stage, laser weeding. So machine vision, okay, a camera, either from a UAV or a ground vehicle, um, can recognize the growing point of the weed. Okay? So we've gone down right to that point now, and the laser can kill the weed at the growing point, so we don't need any chemicals. Okay? And we are developing active technology at the minute, which will soon be ready to go out in the field in that way. Now let's look at harvesting, okay? and I'm going to call this selective harvesting. We estimate up to 60% of harvested crop is not of saleable quality. Okay? So, field of lettuces. Supermarkets and consumers um, determine that they want all of these lettuces to be the same size. So we harvest the whole field and they get rid of some because they're not big enough. Okay? So we've got waste. So if we've got an autonomous machine that can go out at any time of day or night with no operator, measure the crop and only harvest the ones that are ready and then come back out later on to get the other ones when they are, okay, we get rid of that wastage. Okay, and hopefully it will allow us to do more um, in situ. Okay, so rather than keep moving stuff around, the more processing we can do uh, at source, the better. Okay, so you remove all of that downwind grading, for example, of the crop. Okay, and again, this is our vision of, of that uh, selective harvester. Okay, the bit on the back is just a trailer where you can store the crop. Okay. So, by applying this lean production thinking to robotic agriculture, the aim is to minimise energy and resources going into crop production, um, intelligently, intelligently targeting the inputs. So, the uh, dedicated application of the fertilizer, for example, the pesticide, can save up to 99% of that input or 100% if we're going to the, the laser weeding, okay, which is incredible. Uh, but it does rely on data to define those requirements. We're looking at minimizing soil damage and compaction. Okay? Don't damage it in the first place. So smaller, smarter, lighter machines, uh, we can use multiples of those to get that increased work, work rate. Okay? So precision farming, moving ahead, is smart farming. We're looking to reinvent this mechanization system with small, smart machines that can care for individual plants. Okay? And it's that care for the individual needs of the individual plants. Okay? So if we transfer that into curriculum needs, well, we've just identified by looking ahead at the technology 
that graduates will need to be increasingly capable in machine vision, pattern recognition, systems integration, taking a sensor that can identify whatever the thing is we need to identify, understanding it, communicating it, doing something with it, and obviously it will need some power to be able to do that, whatever that power is. Um, We'll need machine intelligence. Okay? It's got to be able to make decisions itself. It's autonomous. It's out there on its own. And all of that will require some programming. Okay? But okay, I put it to you that that is really interesting technology. Right? It's the future. Robots. Okay? We've all seen them on telly. Right? But this stuff is developing so quickly. And these graduates are going to be, so if they, grad, if they start a course in a couple of years' time, they won't graduate until nearly 2021, 2022. And we're trying to solve some of these problems by about seven or eight years later. So that, that's why they need to be industry ready, to hit the ground running to help solve the problems. And this technology might have changed. But then we want them to be useful for another 50, 60 years. It will definitely have changed in that time. So it comes back to how much of that do they need? Okay, or if we look at the needs of the customer again, okay, let me propose that the real need perhaps is the more behavioral stuff. We referred to it as soft skills yesterday. Capability to identify customer need and project manage. Capability to find, evaluate, and synthesize information. Capability in the underlying core fundamental principles. So they need some technical, but they perhaps also need this lean thinking that I've just introduced to you. Okay. Now, that identification of need is very, very important because the systems they're designing have a need. The customers they work for have a need. What, the hardest bit of any project is identifying that need. The rest is just engineering. Okay? So, I mentioned the words capability several times. Industry ready engineer, somebody who is capable in these things. But what do I actually mean by capable? And let me propose my thoughts on it to you. So I'm going to go back to this process. Okay? Uh, school leaver, 17 years old, 18 years old, comes to university to do a degree, so we do our curriculum with them. And out the end, we want this industry ready graduate who I'm suggesting needs to be capable. Okay? Now, first principle that I'm going to propose is that the student. The person going on this journey isn't our customer. This person is our customer because only they know what these need to have. We don't know because we're not working in the industry. We're in this one. They don't know because, well, they haven't done it yet. Okay, so only they do. Okay, so industry is our customer. We have to make sure that our curriculum and whatever we do in this bit is what industry needs, not just what we're comfortable with, what we've already done. Okay? And there's a commonly held belief that students should own their learning. This might be a controversial one. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Let me propose that my view is that we should own that journey. We have to find out what these people need, and we have to make sure that these students are industry ready by the end of it. I'm not saying that students aren't responsible, but we can't just throw some information at them and just assume that it's gone in, assume that they know it, assume they've engaged with it. Okay? They're our responsibility. They're paying us to make those decisions and do whatever it takes to get them there. Okay. So therefore, it's often believed that the ability to apply knowledge infers capability. I've told you now go and do it. You can do it. Don't come back and ask. Okay? I'm going to finish with a little bit of lovely educational theory just before lunch. You've hopefully heard of Bloom's taxonomy or Bloom's revised taxonomy. It's been revised to make it a little bit easier to read. Where when students start, it's all about remembering stuff. Okay? And as they go through about understanding it and then being able to apply it and then being able to analyze it and so on but I think it's missing something. So let me finish with this. The capability extension. That's where I want them to get to. So I think part of our job on that journey that they go through with us is to give them the experience which will give them 
self-motivation and self-belief. So by the time they leave us, they've already done it. They know they can do it. Okay? They have that belief in themselves. And it's that, the motivation and the belief, that makes them capable. Okay? This is another picture. It's in the notes. I'll let you study that at your leisure. Okay, so last tiny little bit and then I'm done. I just want to demonstrate to you that the potential for this lean thinking to address, address the global food security issues and the capability model that I've just thrown at you to ensure industry-ready graduates, okay, that I can actually demonstrate that to you. Okay, that's what we've been working on through the development of these autonomous robots, developing the future technology. Okay? So, this autonomous uh, precision seed planting robot that I explained to you was done by some final year students who entered it in a European competition and came second against doctoral students and so on. Okay? So they've developed the vehicle of the future. Okay? <coughs> Prove it wasn't a fluke the year before. We, we won and we came runners up as well. Um, and this year we've had a student that's been applying this lean thinking to reduce downtime. Now one of the big issues that people have with these agricultural robots is the, the cost output. Okay? Uh, farmers, for example, having to afford this technology. Well, one of the principles of lean is that you try and do more with less. Okay? So we had a student that looked at a recent potato harvest using a particular type of agricultural machine, applied some lean methodologies to it, and showed that you could without, well, with virtually minimal outlay, in one season, that farmer could have saved 375 hours of downtime and nearly £23,000 in repair costs. So his machine would be working for longer and it wouldn't cost them as much to keep it running. Just by having a bit of a think, a bit of a plan. And finally, another student project looked at optimising an onion grading facility. Okay? And this was all about making the layout more efficient, removing the waste, removing the, the unnecessary transport and so on, um, and savings across the board, whichever way you look at it, there can be financial savings, time savings, um, you can get your product to customer quicker, and so on. Okay, so the technology is exciting, and we're going to need technology looking ahead, okay, particularly the data communication, but it all comes back to those fundamental principles. Understanding the need and doing whatever's possible in the most efficient way. But there are techniques that are already out there that we can use and apply. Thank you.